Welcome, everyone. My name is Scott. I'm a software engineer on the map rendering team in Seattle. And I'm Jonah. I'm the design lead for maps. Today, we're going to cover four different things. First, we're going to try to get you inspired to create a map of all your own. Second, we're going to cover three design principles that lead you through the process of creating the perfect map. And then we're going to cover some building blocks that are all the different ways that you can change the map to what you want. And lastly, we're going to combine the design principles with the building blocks and put it into practice. All right. So what is the perfect map for your site? Is it the standard Google map? Is it a colorful map? Is it a monotone map? Is it a subtle map? Or is it something else? Old Maps Online let you find historical maps in libraries around the world. And they've got a map that really feels historical and old. They've got a faded color palette. They've got this cool kind of grain effect that you see over the top. They're going to be at the Maps sandbox outside after the session, as will we. And uh, Trulia have also done a really good job of this. Uh, this is their house search that you can see here. And they've got uh, colors that are very harmonious with their brand. They've also kind of de-emphasized the roads and other information that the users don't care about. And they've emphasized the data that they really want to present, which is the, the greenhouse prices you see here. Now, Trulia actually did some uh, usability studies on their map. And it turned out that users really care about the position of parks in relation to the houses. So they made sure that they were very emphasized. And you can meet them at the map sandbox after this session as well. And um, speaking of Trulia, this is their new commute time map. This is pretty cool, too. They've got a black marker in the middle, you can see here. And then the green places are places that you can access uh, quickly from here. And the orange places are places that take a little bit longer. And this shows the versatility of this kind of faded base map that they've got, that they can overlay information harmoniously on top. So to answer what is the perfect map for your site, there are three things you're going to need to consider. The first is to remove unnecessary information. The second is to refine the data that you have left. And the third is to test multiple zooms and regions. And I'm going to take you through each of those in turn. So to remove unnecessary information, the first thing you need to consider is what is the message that you want to convey? And what, who is the audience that you want to convey the message to? Now, once you know the message and the audience, Think about all the information you need to convey to them and remove everything else. So here's a good example. This is our New York map that we have um, today on Google. Um, this is pretty general purpose. We've got a lot of different information on here. We've got road colors to convey the different types of road we've got. We've got some highway badges you can see running down the left. We've got one-way arrows all over the streets. We've got points of interest. You can see little buildings and stuff. We've got parks. We've got uh, transit data. There's a lot of different things on here. But when a user goes to the Layers menu and turns on the uh, transit layer, then we have a pretty clear signal that the user ca um, cares about public transit. So in this case, we can remove some of the driving information. We've taken away the, um, the one-way arrows. We've taken away the colors on the streets. We've taken away the road badges. And now when we've added the uh, public transit lines on there, you can see that they stand out a lot more than they would have done if we'd kept all the other colors on the map. Now, if we take that to its logical extreme, we could actually remove pretty much all the other information. So here we've dropped away a lot of the businesses. We've taken away the parks. We've taken away all of the street labels. And now the public transit information really, really stands out, not because we've done anything special to the public transit, but just because we've removed all the other unnecessary information. So it's a very focused map now. So we've taken away all the information we don't want. What's the next thing to do is to refine the data we have left. So to do this, you need to take into consideration what's the important data that you want to convey, and what's the data that's more kind of background context information, and then choose the colors and the styles appropriately to that. So um, your primary information, you want to make sure that really visually pops, and then all of the rest of the information kind of sit, sit back and don't take too much attention. 
And while we're on the subject of colors, a good color scheme obviously is something that you want to take into consideration. Uh, first, to be harmonious with the general brand of the website that you're putting it on. And second of all, color can be really powerful in creating an emotional response with your users. So if you're going to create like a, a bright versus a dark map, or a very colorful or colorless map, that can uh, really resonate with your audience in a different way. So I'll take you through a couple of examples again. Here's a map we quickly created for San Francisco parks. And you can see here that we've pretty much removed all the labels except for the park labels. So that's removing the unnecessary information. And then we've made sure that the parks are very prominently colored. So that's the first thing that you see. And all the other information, like the roads and the background and the, and the water and stuff, is really the background information. And we've picked a really nice kind of positive, vibrant color scheme here. So this feels very kind of natural and, and kind of good. And I'll contrast that with another map. Let's, this is a map all about San Francisco roads. Now, the information we've removed this time is everything except for the road labels. And the roads themselves are dark. They're very, very prominent. And in general, we've just chosen a kind of a, a, a heavier color scheme. So the overall map feels a lot more serious and more somber. Going back to old maps online, you can see when we see the map now in the context of the overall site, the, um, the whole experience is very, very on brand. Like old maps online is all about feeling historical. So they've got this kind of um, faded color scheme. They've got all the yellows. And the map really, really fits in well with that. And truly, I have the same story. Their overall website, Chrome, has got kind of a light grays and light blues. And that's their kind of general background color that you see mirrored on the map. And then they have this bright green that they're using as an emphasis color for the important information, first of all, on the website itself, but also on the map. And the last thing that you need to consider is make sure that the map works in different zooms and different regions around the world. So you can see here that at far zooms, uh, the main information we've got are around countries and country labels, borders. Sometimes you can see the major highways. When you move into the medium zooms, new information is appearing. You can then see neighborhoods. You can see geographical features like national parks and things like that. And the road layout is actually a very important thing here. So you can really see the difference between the orange highways and the yellow arterial roads here. Arterials are the roads that travel through a city. Uh, generally pretty wide, may have a median. And by the time we get to the deep zooms, the things we're really paying attention to here are the 2D building footprints. And we've got some 3D buildings. You can see some points of interest around here. And we've got lots of new information appears at the very deepest zooms. So it's worth making, making sure that you check your map for all of these different zoom levels. You can easily imagine that you could create a map that looks great in San Francisco and you know, push that out, and then you've forgotten to include something that, that appears at a very deep zoom. So what we would really uh, recommend is designing your map for the deep zoom and then kind of let it degrade gracefully as you zoom out, because we generally tend to take things away as we zoom out rather than add things. Now, speaking of deep zooms, here's a deep zoom here of Turkmenistan. Now, this is quite interesting. You can see that the data here is super sparse. So hardly any of the roads have labels. We've got very small uh, smattering of building footprints and of uh, building information. We've got kind of one rail line that's running through that. Now, compare this with the exact same zoom in Tokyo. This is crazy busy. We've got 3D buildings all over the place. We've got underground uh, information. We've got traffic lights. We've got business icons. We've got things all over the place. So it's a good idea, again, to design for this rich data case and then have it degrade gracefully. You don't want to be designing um, in your local area, which maybe doesn't have all the information that um, could, could be elsewhere. Right. And in the case of Turkmenistan, we have MapMaker in that country and many other countries of the world. And so users can go and add information at any time. So you must think about the, the case where they have lots and lots of data. And Japan leads us to another interesting issue, which is of local conventions. So in many countries around the world, we use uh, localized iconography and colors. So in Japan, for example, you can see here that they use green highways. And this might be quite different to what you're used to seeing if you're looking at a map of Europe or America, where you see um, all highways are orange. And the UK is another example of this. You can see that in the UK, we've got these blue highways. So it's worth bearing this kind of thing in mind. If you're going to be changing styles and colors, um, it might be affecting local users in a way that you might not first um, anticipate. 
So remember, remove the unnecessary information, refine the remaining data, and test it for multiple zooms and regions. So I've given you a little hint of the things you think, need to think about um, to create your perfect map. And now I'm going to hand you over to Scott, who's going to explain to you how to do it. Thanks, Jonah. So Jonah went over the three principles that you can help guide the design of the map. I'm going to cover the three different things to consider when thinking about how to implement the design that you want. Uh, the first thing are stylers. Stylers are the, an object or thing that takes in the existing style of the map and mutates it. Uh, it either does that by taking the input values and tweaking them or just overriding them. Uh, once you can do that, you need to be able to restrict what you style on the map. And there's two ways to do that restriction. The first is with feature type, and the second is with element type. Now let's go into those in more detail. So stylers, again, they mutate the existing style of the map. Uh, many of them are relative, so we'll go through those first and then get to the more powerful ones. The first relative styler that we have is the hue styler. And it takes all the colors of the map and tints them to one specific color. That doesn't mean that it changes the lightness. It just means that everything is tinted towards, in this case, red. We also have saturation. This changes the intensity of the color uh, for everything on the map. Here, we're removing the color altogether using a negative 100%. You can also increase this. We also have lightness. This changes the overall lightness, uh, again, by percentage. And there's two other related stylers to lightness. The first is gamma. Gamma lightens and darkens the map just like lightness does, but has a great property of leaving whites white and blacks black. This means that your labels that use, or our labels that typically use black and white will be preserved. They'll still be readable. And we also have invert lightness. This changes the colors from, like, say, a, a light orange to something that's a dark orange. This is great if you have a dark-themed website or want to give a feeling of nighttime um, without uh, losing the color scheme of a typical Google map. So those are all relative stylers. They've taken in a color and they've produced an, another color. Let's talk a little bit about more powerful stylers that we have. The first is visibility. Uh, here you can see I've destroyed the map to some degree. There is no map anymore. I've turned everything off. Um, this is a convoluted example, but it proves the point. This is extremely, extremely powerful, and I can't reiterate this enough. Uh, in the first step of the design principles, which is remove all unnecessary information, this is your tool. Use it, and don't be scared to use it even more so than you might have thought. You can always bring something back in later, later stages. In addition to visibility, we have a new styler called weight. This is just added today. We're really excited about it. And this changes the thickness of both the inside of roads and the outside of roads and any other features that are represented with a line. So that's available today. Also available today is color. Color sets the RGB color of all of the things that you selected uh, to that color. You can see here, again, I've gone a little bit extreme and changed the entire map to red. Uh, but it's very, very powerful, and it's a great tool to get the map to use the precise colors that you want for your brand or the precise colors that you want for your, um, to complement your data. If you want to take it back a step and only use it in a refined way, here's an example where I've just changed the watercolor to white. Uh, this is a great tool if you want to move the user's eye towards the land rather than the water because the, the blue that we have the water typically can really draw the eye away from the land. So that's a new feature today, color. Um, we're really, really, really excited to see what you come up with, um, this new powerful styler that we've introduced. 
Now let's go into how you can use these very powerful stylers in limited ways, such as here, as I've done here. The first way to do it is by selecting a feature type. So features are any place on the map, and what we've done is we've categorized them. Today, I'm going to talk about the top categories in our hierarchy of features. Uh, some types have subtypes that allow you to get more granular. So let's dissect the map of San Francisco that we've been using for stylers. The first feature type we have is administrative features. These are things such as cities and provinces. We have POIs. This is short for point of interest. This includes things such as parks, coffee shops, hospitals, and there's also subtypes to this that will let you get more granular. Well, you'll see us use that later. We also have type road. This is all of the roads that cars can travel on, in addition to footpaths, uh, which are typically in things like parks. We also have transit. Transit is all your mass transit. You can see here it's rail lines, and you can see the BART icons and also the ferry lines. We have feature type landscape. This is the background color. This is your land color, in addition to things such as built up area, if there's structures in that area, or uh, things like islands. The last top category we have is water. Uh, this includes bays, rivers, lakes, all that sort of stuff. So that's feature type. Uh, the other way that we can break down the map is by element type. And I think of elements as the way we've chosen to represent a feature on the map. The first way you can do that is by selecting all labels. Uh, here you can see we have both symbols and icons in addition to textual labels that include the names of the features on the map. Today we're announcing that we're allowing for sub types of elements, so sub-element types. Uh, the first one that we're introducing today is labels.icon. This selects just the icons so that you can recolor color them or turn them off as you wish. We're also announcing labels.text. This allows you to do the inverse and just select the text. Uh, as you can see, it involves, includes the straight text that are for things like parks, but also the curved text for roads. Uh, furthermore, we're sub categorizing that again into the fill, which is the rendering of the font and the name itself, and the stroke. The stroke is uh, an outline or a border around that, that text fill that is typically used to make the label more readable by adding or ensuring contrast between the fill and the stroke. And also, as you can see here, we have lots of uh, dark orange and light orange, and though those colors emphasize which type of roads those labels are for. So that's labels. The other thing that we allow you to select by element type is geometry. This is all the areas that you see and all the line features that represent things such as roads and rivers, all that sort of thing. Today we're also announcing that we're allowing you to sub-select geometry uh, in a similar way to text, where this is all the fills of all our geometry. Uh, this is really, really useful for roads, particularly, because the inside of the road is considered the fill, and the outside of the road is considered a stroke. So typically, you'll get strokes on things like roads, but you may also get them around areas, such as land parcels. So those are all the element types that you can select. So we've covered three things. We've covered all the different ways you can change the map with stylers, and then we've covered the two ways that you can dissect the map to reduce the impact of stylers. What Jonah and I are going to do now is we're going to put both these building blocks I just covered and the, the three design principles into practice to show you how you can create the perfect map. So to start with, uh, my thumb is weak, apparently. Uh, this is how you show a Google map. This is just meant as an overview. There were lots of awesome talks earlier that covered this. Uh, things I'd like to point out, though, is you can, as you can see, we're loading the uh, Maps API 
JavaScript. We have a dot, dot, dot where I'm going to add some more JavaScript later. And we also have a div that is where the map will end up showing. Uh, that's 640 by 40, and it has an ID of map. So what JavaScript do we use? What we do is we add an init function that gets called once the window is loaded. And then within that function, we set the map options, which set things like the default zoom, the center that we want, and the base or the map type that we want to show by default. In this case, it's just the standard Google roadmap. And we do that. We take those options, and we pass that into the, our construction of the map object that also takes the div element that we want the map to show up in. So now that we've got a standard Google map, how do we make it our styled map? Uh, here's the changes that you need to make. We need to, do, we need to create a styled map type like we would create any other map type. The styled map type or that we can use just like any other map type. To create a styled map type, we provide two different things. We provide all the styles that we want to apply to the Google base map. Uh, this is a list of different styles, and we'll show you examples of what a style is a little bit later. Um, and then we also provide it with map options, which include things such as the name of the, the map type that you're creating. Uh, here you can see I've also, um, sorry, uh, now that we have that object, we want to set the RID to that map type object so that we can switch between all the different types of maps. And that's what I've done at the end. Uh, I've also created this ID as a constant so that we can have the map default to it also. So that's how you use a styled map. Uh, here's Jonah to walk through how you create the design for your map. OK. So um, we're going to create a map of people who like dogs versus people who like cats in San Francisco. So we'll say that the dog lovers are going to be the, um, the red dots here, and the cat lovers are going to be the green dots. And we've got quite a lot of information going on on the map here. We've probably got too many colors, I think. We've got all the yellows of the roads and the greens of the parks. And that's um, interfering a little bit with the information we're trying to overlay. And also, there's too many labels on there. Like, I think we're trying to read the labels a little bit much. And also, the labels look awkward with the, the overlaid data on top. So I think what we want is something a bit more like this. Now, here you can see that the information is really standing out very prominently. And then the background information of the map is really sinking back for context and is not um, grabbing your attention. So how can we create something like this? We'll start back with the base map. Now, I suppose the obvious thing to do is probably just to desaturate this map completely and get rid of the labels. So let's give that a try. So here you can see an example of how to use a sequence of styles to create the map that you want. Uh, we have two styles here. We, first, we have one that has no element type and no feature type. This means that it applies to everything on the map. And so we're desaturating that by 100%. We have a second style that is restricted to only labels. And for that, we turn them all off using visibility. OK, so this looks all right, but it's kind of looking a bit crude. Like something that's really bugging me here is the water is very, very similar color to the parks now. So they're kind of blending into each other. The roads are quite visually noisy. Like they're, they're distracting me a little bit. Like you, especially you can see the highways, they're very dark. And there's just in general, like there's a lot of patches and lines. I think we can do a lot better than this. So let's start again. And um, we'll go back to the first principle. And first of all, we'll remove some of the unnecessary information. So you know, the most obvious candidate here is the labels. They're pretty much just there distracting you, causing them to read them. And we can assume for the um, purposes of this example that the users are familiar with San Francisco. So we'll go ahead and get rid of the labels. And that is immediately looking a ton better. But now I'm starting to notice a few more things. Like you can see kind of in the middle of the map there, we've got some brown and kind of pink patches. These are actually the universities and the, um, and the hospitals. And they're actually part of the points of interest, the POIs. So we don't need these for the uh, purposes of this demo. So we'll get rid of those ones as well. And now I've just made a mistake because we've just got rid of the parks too. So we'll have to bring those back. But 
for the meantime, we'll have a little look at the rest of the, what's going on. The next most obvious thing is the, these kind of dark colored transit lines that you see running horizontally and vertically. And also, you can see the little dotted ferry lines in the top right corner here. So again, we don't really need this information. We'll get rid of that too. And now we've got a fairly minimal map. And I think right now we're probably done with removing the information. So now it's time to refine the information that we've got left. Now, the water is looking pretty heavy at the moment. I think that's probably the, you know, the main colored element on the screen. This is drawing our attention. So we don't really want that. Uh, I quite liked what Scott did earlier, which was to, to remove the water and change it to white. So I think let's do that, and that will um, give us a nice clean background canvas to work from. And so this is immediately looking a load better. And this introduces the new feature that we've got today um, to recolor things directly. Um, so now this park thing's bugging me. So let's bring the parks back again. I don't think we want them to be a fully prominent green. So we'll just use a, a quite a subtle gray because we want them there for context and orientation of the map, but not to be a, something that you really notice. So here's the parks added back in again. Yeah. So as you can see, we just have individual styles in the, the, on the left side, typically. Uh, the expectation is that we're adding those to the list that we have. And so to turn on parks, we don't need to go back and change the visibility, the POI visibility off. We can simply add another style that selects our POI.parks, which is just our parks uh, and just their geometry, and then turn them on in addition to coloring them. And again, it's important to note, as Scott said, we are bringing just the geometry back in here. If we'd forgotten to include that, then we'd have brought the labels back in, which isn't what we wanted. So this is now looking fairly good. The obvious last thing to remove now is the roads. Now, we want to keep the roads on the map because they're good for, again, orientation. But we don't really need the colors. And I don't think we need a distinction between the stroke and the fill here. It's just adding visual noise. So let's simplify these. And we've just given them a, a kind of a gray fill here. Um, so this is now nearly done. I think probably the last thing we should do here is the roads are still looking just that tiny little bit um, too heavy because they're all a little bit fat. So we can refine these a little bit further with the new width control that we've announced today and make them a bit thinner. Yeah, so uh, as you can see here, we're setting the weight of all the three different types of roads. Uh, what's interesting is that we're, we're setting the arterials and the locals to the same weight. The reason this doesn't screw up our hierarchy, where we want the highways to be fatter than the arterials and the arterials to be fatter than local roads, is because in San Francisco, arterials are typically separated by a median, which means we actually draw two lines next to each other and causes them to look fat, even though the weights are identical to the weight of the local road. Yeah, and this may not be the case everywhere. Um, in you know, different parts of the world, it could be that the arterials are, are you know, uh, done as one road instead of two, in which case the arterial road thing we've got here would probably need to be you know, one or 0 0.75 or something like that to maintain that sense of hierarchy. Yeah. But for San Francisco here, this is looking great, actually. So I think we can add our dogs and cats data versus, uh, back again. And this is looking pretty good. There's one problem here which is that this is probably fine to most of you, but maybe a couple of you in the audience are seeing something a bit more like this. This is what you'll see if you're colorblind, um, where reds and greens distinguishing between them can be a bit of a problem. So there's a few different approaches you could use to, um, to combat this. Uh, one good one is to just uh, change the brightness of the red and the, the green. We actually do this on our traffic layer. Um, another one would be to change the shapes. So maybe the red things would be triangles and the green things would be circles. We actually considered using cute little cats and dogs on the map, but we thought that was a bit cheesy. So for now, we'll just um, give it a nice Google I.O. themed set of colors. And there we have it. We've got a nice map of San Francisco. We can clearly visualize the data on top. It's taken us about 10 minutes. That's not bad. So the next stage would be to check the different zooms and regions. But something I didn't mention before is there's actually a clever little trick here that we can do. So I'll give you Scott back to uh, introduce you that. Thank you. So Jonah and I work on Google Maps. And because we work on Google Maps, we have to think about everyone in the entire world. That's a good thing. We like that. But it makes it really hard to get a design that works everywhere. Um, 
In addition to that, we have to check every zoom level. We have 20 different zoom levels that we have a map on, and a design that works for zoom 4 may not work for zoom 17. However, you guys have a better idea of what your users want from your map, so you can restrict both the zooms that the user looks at and the places in the world that they, that they can see on your map. So, how do you do that? To restrict the zoom, you simply, simply set the min zoom and the max zoom on the map options before you create your map. Here you can see I've used a variable for my default zoom so that if I want to change my default, it's easy. Um, and I've also, that's what the zoom uh, option on the object is, is also the default zoom. And then I'm just allowing two more zoom levels in addition to that. So that's restricting zoom. Restricting the center is a little bit trickier. What I have here is a lat long bounds at the top that the center of the viewport will be restricted to. In our example, this is a, a rough bounding box for the data that we're showing. And then on every center changed uh, event callback, we take the center of the map, we see if it's in the, those bounds, and if it is in those bounds, we're done. Otherwise, we need to move it back into the bounds, and we do that by capping the latitude and the longitude and then resetting the center of our, of our map. So now that we've restricted the zoom and the center, we know where people are going to look at. Uh, Jonah's design was only done for zoom 13, so let's check the other two zooms that we're going to allow them to see. So this is zoom 14. It looks good. There's nothing that we didn't expect. Uh, you can see the nice Golden Gate Park there running across the screen, along with the Presidio above it. I think it looks good, so Zoom 14 looks fine. However, Zoom 15 doesn't look fine. Uh, on Google Maps at Zoom 15, we introduce land parcels. And in this case, the land parcels are really distracting because they're adding a lot of visual noise to the map, which is exactly what we tried to avoid in the design that we did. So. Using this styling API, we can simply take them off. Uh, here you can see I've added a style that says for administrative features, which land parcels are a part of, turn them off. We don't need it. So that would be one way we could do that is by appending it to all the styles that I showed you earlier. Another uh, cleverer way is to do it only for Zoom 15. So how do you change the style of the map for a given zoom. Here's a code snippet that I've done. You can see what I'm doing is I'm listening, listening for the zoom changed event, and whenever I get that, I'm changing the styled map type that's associated, associated with our map type ID. Uh, I'm doing that using an object, so I just give it the zoom to the object, and I, uh, the styles per zoom object, I give it the zoom, and then I'll get back the particular styled map type that I want. I, as I explained it, the admin off was just an addition to our previous style, so I've used uh, array concatenation in JavaScript to just add it to the one zoom that we, that we need it. So, our one live demo. Here we have it all working. Oh, or no. <laughs> <laughs> what did I click? Okay. Just fast forward through them. You wanted to see it all again. Here you go. All right. Don't click anything. All right. So as you can see, this is a live version of the, of the demo that we just walked through. And as I pull up, I get constrained. I can't move any further. That's great because we then don't need to worry about what this looks like in some place such as Seattle. And we can zoom in. Our circles stay the same. The circles are being done with the new symbols API we launched yesterday. And we can zoom in to zoom 15 again, and now we can't zoom in any, anymore. So that's our live demo. Let's wrap up. All right, so we've given you three principles for the design. 
that you should remember. The first is to remove the unnecessary information. The second is to refine the data that you have left. And the third is to test it at multiple zooms and regions that we've just seen here. And we've also um, announced some new features, which is changing the weight of roads and strokes, being able to set the color directly, which is awesome and very powerful, mm -hmm. and also being able to select the fill and the stroke individually. And we hope that if you use all of these new things we've announced today, then you'll be able to create the perfect map for your site. We can't wait to see what you guys come up with. Uh, thank you for coming. We're excited for all these new features. If you have questions, we'll take them now. Please use the mics because this is being recorded. If you'd like to talk to us personally, we're planning on heading over to the Sandbox right after the session. In addition to us being at the Sandbox, representatives from Trulia, Old Maps Online, and UbiLabs, another awesome user of custom map styling, will be there. If you like the session, also please drop a plus one in the box. Any questions? We have one. And uh, can static maps be styled? Yes. I got a thumbs up. OK, because uh, I had an idea where as soon as my page loads, I show a static map. And then mm -hmm. after half a second, when the full JavaScript map loads, I'd replace it. And hopefully the user wouldn't notice. I don't know if that would work. So for those of you watching at home, the JavaScript API does this trick. Oh, OK, well, thanks. But not if you're using a static map. Styled map. Not, not with styles? OK. Well, so I work on the rendering part of it, not the JavaScript side. OK, so the second question is, I still want my users to be able to switch to satellite view. Can they do a hybrid with our styled you know, roads on top of uh, satellite imagery? Yes, you can style hybrid also. Cool, thanks. Do you have support for transparent maps? So I could like have labels on top of something else I draw? Not at the moment, but it's something we've heard from other people. Uh, you, mentioned, you mentioned that it's important to keep certain elements on the map for uh, context and orientation. Uh, and I think it would be important to at least have like the, the, lab, the label California and like San Francisco, but hide all the other like road names. Is that possible? It's possible to only show administrative labels, such as cities. So localities are what we typically call cities, and you can leave those explicitly. Um, there's no way to ensure currently that a label such as San Francisco alone will show up. So would like the, the names of parks still show up then in that so the, case? The parks will go. You'll, you'll, you'll hold on to the city names and the right. uh, neighborhood names. But you can get rid of all the parks. You can get rid of the road labels, all of, all of those things. Okay, so depending good. on which bucket that it fits into, you can turn on the big ones. Thanks. Yeah. That, should, that should be it for me. <laughs> can I style points and polygons that I've uploaded with the Google Apps Engine? There is a separate API for that. OK. All right. Well, we'll be around in the sandbox. So if there's any questions you want to give to us in person uh, instead of on the mic, we'll be very happy to hear them. But other than that, um, yeah, thanks for coming. And we're excited to see what you come up with.